All right, hi, my name is Amy Pelaez, and I'm going to be going over prof the Professional and Ethical Compliance Code, specifically um, the BACB Ethics Code uh, Section 4.09 to 6.02. Um, this is the BCBA exam prep study group, and I'm going to get started first with the disclaimer, as we always do. Um, the BCBA exam prep study group was created by and for students to earn their BCBA, BCA, BA certification. Most of the leaders and participants are not a BCBA or BCA, BA at this time. These meetings are meant to have active discussions to collaborate, ask questions, and provide helpful suggestions to better understand the BACB 4th edition task list concepts. Due to this, it is important to know that all viewers and participants are responsible to verify the accuracy of the information being provided in order to successfully prepare for the BCBA, BCABA exam. So because of the, this, we must have ethical considerations and we have to refrain from sharing any BCBA um, test questions. Um, we also need to refrain from sharing any paid resources or identifiable client information. And um, lastly, if we do share any open resources or pre-reviewed ar articles, books uh, of any kind, please make sure to give credit to the author. Finally, we are in the field of ABA and we must act in a professional and ethical manner at all times. So because of this, we created some um, rules to make sure um, that our meetings go well. And um, number one is please make sure to mute your microphones. Um, in order to allow everyone to speak, um, in order for the meetings to be clear. And uh, number two is allow the leaders and all participants to have a turn to speak without any interruptions. And number three is make sure to be respectful of others and refrain from using any inappropriate language. And finally, um, we, I would love if everyone can just relax and have a little bit of fun. All right, so as always, I have some announcements. Um, we have one new person in the last meeting. I always um, get together with the leaders um, on a separate chat. And uh, I just like to know, you know, if there's anybody new that is going to our meeting. So this week it has been someone called Anita. I don't know if she's here, but thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, every person that joins our group is, um, is welcomed and you know feel free to ask any questions and collaborate um, the more the merrier um, and as always remember to like share and subscribe to the channel guys we have 150 subscribers I was shocked when I saw last night I was like wow amazing 150 that's awesome yeah um, if you're also interested in free one-to-ones we've been doing a lot of them and they're going very well. Some, some are not just one-to-ones. We're having small groups too, uh, three to four people. So if you guys are interested, just email or message us. If you're interested in emailing, just be, it's the BCBA exam prep group at gmail.com. All right. I, like I said in the beginning of the meeting, I'm going to go over as much as I can and as fast as I can. Uh, I created um, fill in the blanks for 4.09 all the way to 5.06, but as you guys can see, it's a lot. So these last three, 5.07, 6.01, and 6.02, it'll just be just straight discussions. Okay, so let's get started. For the first one, which is 4.09 least restrictive procedures. I wrote the page numbers here. So the source is page 135 on Bailey third edition. So for those of you that have the second edition, try to find to see if it's somewhere around that page. Um, if you do have the book, I encourage to open the book because um, this is straight from the book. So, you know, this is open book guys, <laughs> take advantage. All right, so the first question is, Always recommend least restrictive procedures if they are blank. Effective. Effective, perfect. Okay, so only do that if it's effective. So um, sh should we do that if it's not effective? No. All right, so least restrictive or most restrictive. So these are some examples of different techniques we use. Just tell me if they are least restrictive or they're most restrictive. What do you guys think? 
Most. Me mechanical restraint. Most? Okay. Yes, you're right. How about timeout? Is it least restrictive or most restrictive? Well, it depends what kind you're giving them. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. Restraint is most. I would say least. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Please. Because think about it. If you put a child in timeout, you're not holding them down. You're not doing anything. You're just telling them to sit in timeout. They can get up and run around if they want to. So you're, you know, it is least restrictive. How about with response costs? It's, it's not restrictive at all. Yeah. So it's, le they, they, on the book, it says least restrictive to none. So mm -hmm. you're right. But I put here, because I only gave two choices, least restrictive. All right, we're going to move on to, uh, does everybody understand what this section is about? Do you have any questions? All right, we'll move on. All right, 4.10, avoiding har harmful reinforcers. It's page 135 on Bailey, third edition. Potential reinforcers may be harmful to the blank and the blank of the client. Health. Health and what? Welfare. They usually go together. Development. So it's the health and development of the client. They also may require excessive motivating operations to be what? In order to be what? We talked about it on the slide before. Effective. Effective, perfect. All right, so we're gonna go here. This is similar to what we did before on the other slide. Harmful or not harmful? Tobacco in the 50s and 60s. Remember guys, in the 50s and 60s, smoking was almost like something normal. So not, not effective, right? But even though there was nothing about, like, people used to, uh, on the book it says it, people used to smoke in restaurants, people used to, you know, smoke everywhere, but mm -hmm. still it was harmful. So even though it was considered social, socially appropriate, it was still harmful. So, okay, and then how about excessive candy? Well, it is harmful. It is harmful. So how about if a, a parent gives you consent to give them candy as edibles, like giving them a reinforcer using candy all the time? Should you do it? No. 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 And why? Just, can anybody tell me why tobacco and candy shouldn't be given? It's in the ethics. I know that. Cause I... <laughs> well, because it's going to affect their health. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Harmful to the health. Perfect. The sugar and the candy. Does but... anybody have any more examples that you want me to add to the... In the past, I've used uh, like alcohol, like, which is basically the same as cigars. Uh-huh. Like anything that is addictive. And also, you should keep in mind also uh, things that could, you know, for allergies. I mean, you can't give them something if they're allergic to it just because you think it's effective with Joey. You know, you're not going to give it to Billy if he's allergic to it. Okay, that actually made me think about something else. How about if a child is on a special diet, like right. a ketogenic diet or a gluten free, dairy free diet? And fatty foods, somebody said here. Hey, said. Fatty foods. Good. You can give them to me. I like them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but too much is harmful. So. Of course. All right. 4.11, discontinuing behavior change programs and behavior analytic services. That's page 136 on Bailey 3rd edition. All right. So what are some tools? This is straight from the book, guys. What are some tools that can be used in the field of ABA to find out if objectives are met? So I wrote two, but I think there's more than two. But on the book, there's only one. I wrote two of them. 
think of two tools that we use a lot in the field of ABA to find out if objectives are met. The ABLES. ABLES is one. And the, what's that, VB map or whatever? Good. Why? Because they have already um, preset, you know, skills that the individual should have at a certain time. So you can use them as guidelines to see if the progress is made. Okay, good. So you're very close. Uh, well, you almost, almost answered it completely, but on the bottom I put a little hint. I put, it looks at blank and it allows assessing the child using blank. So you answered the first part. So it looks at performance across many areas and it allows assessing the child using what? We assess the child using what? What do we use as the criteria? Those objectives. Uh, we use different objectives. How, okay, so I'm gonna give, give you guys more, more of a, um, um, another hint. Um, do we use our, do we use their real age or do we use their developmental age? Developmental age. Okay, so if a, so if, um, if you have a child that has autism that's 10, but they're functioning at a level that's a five-year-old, you're going to use the five-year-old, right? Mm -hmm. Developmental age, right? Just to make sure that they're meeting everything first before you have them move on. If eventually you want them to get to that 10 year old level but you have to start off slow so you're going to use their developmental age okay the next question is should a bcba discontinue services if a government behavior analytic program is offered to the client due to financial necessity yes or no So I wrote this question on myself because on the book there's a it's an actual case study about a situation like this. So if you guys want to read up on that, you could, but this is just one question. I think it would depend if the needs of the client were going to continue to be met in that program, but if they were not, I would say no. Okay. So the answer is yes. So the main um, word here is financial necessity. Okay. In the case study that they were, that they have in the book on page 136, it says that a BCBA was trying to stop a family from getting going into a government behavior analytic program because the child was doing very well but the parent had to take out credit cards the parent had to you know get on a loan to pay it you know all of that so obviously the bcba wants the best for the client but they can't afford it so they're going to lose their house they're going to lose their car they're going to lose you know it's it's you got to look at everything as a whole so because that program was offered to them, you have to almost fade yourself out and fade the other program in, you know, in a way that it won't affect the client. So the answer is yes. All right. Do you understand or? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good question too, food for thought. All right, it, it, like I said, it's on page 136 on Bailey. All right, page um, section 5.01, supervisory competence, it's page 144 on Bailey, third edition. Okay. A competent behavior analyst is one who has the necessary blank to perform the routine task in the general areas of applied behavior analysis. Skills. Knowledge, skills, and ability. So it's three words, knowledge, skill, and ability. So they need to have those three to perform the routine task in general areas of ABA. Okay, now, 
where can a BCBA learn necessary skills to become competent to provide supervision? So if a BCBA, okay, let's say all of us pass the exam next time. No, we will pass the exam next time. And we wanna provide supervision to some supervisees. And we don't know where to learn these skills because obviously we don't know how to provide supervision. What are different things we can do? So these are all different options. Any, just throw them out if you guys workshops. have workshops. Okay, I think it's here. I'm not sure. What is it? CEUs. CEUs and uh, workshops, course, classes, yeah. Uh, consultation, more supervision. I think you guys hit most of them. All right, so graduate programs. Mm -hmm. Experience, supervision, internship, practicum, they all fall in the same category. Continuing education, perfect CEUs. Conferences and trainings. And the last one is, does anybody know? The articles, reading articles. Research. Mm -hmm. All right. Can a newly certified BCBA supervise, train, Ugh, what happened there? Can a newly certified BCBA supervise and train a supervisee on a case with a client that has a life-threatening disorder like epilepsy or a dangerous self-injurious behavior? Can you? Yes or no? So in other words, can a newly certified BCBA supervise a supervisee? on one of those cases well you have to be trained yes, I, to be be, yeah. I see i would think not yeah. epilepsy but sib okay so so if nadia nadia you're taking the exam in may yes okay so if nadia passes her exam in may and she gets put on a case with sib could she train a supervisee with a case that has SIB? Well, in order for you to supervise, you have to receive additional training. Right. So unless I've had that training, no, I would say no. Okay. No. Because you're, you're obviously new. Right. I don't know if you have experience with SIB or not. I do, yeah. Okay, good. But, but what I'm trying to say, it's, it's a lot already to dedicate yourself to a child that has SIB. Even more so to train another person, right. a supervisee, how to do that. Right. So it's, it's, it's a lot, you know? Plus we have to take the class to become one, a right. supervisor. Eight hours, I think, additional hours of training. Right. So, in so order you're saying without, I guess, because I've had a mock question like this before. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's just, it just depends, like, if you, I don't know, if you've had the training or not. Well, or here, here I'm asking specifically not about the child. I'm asking about the supervisee. Right. So if the question was, can a newly certified BCBA uh, take a case with a client that has SIB, the answer is yes. If you have had the experience and the training, had, yes. Right, mm -hmm. if you've had the experience and the training. But if mm -hmm. you're gonna do both at the same time, okay, I would say no because of the supervisor. Yeah. Right, because right. okay. you're not gonna. You're, what's gonna happen is you're gonna dedicate yourself to that client, and you're not gonna provide good supervision. Right. You get me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I understand. All right. All right. The next one is 5.02 supervisory volume. This is page 145 on Bailey third edition. Um, okay, so this session has a lot of information, but I just broke it down as best as I could. All right. The ethics code focuses on the blank of supervision rather than the process. What do they focus on rather than the process? The volume? Mm. Outcome. What is it? The outcome? Yes. Results, outcome. So they care more about 
the supervisee having oh, I didn't read the whole thing. So never mind. The supervisee having the skills mm -hmm. then how you do it. They don't really care what you do, how you taught them. They just want you to have a supervisee that's going to give you good results in the future. So quality versus quantity. Exactly. All right. Next question is each supervisor supervisee must show blank during the supervision process in order for it to be considered blank. Page 145 on Bailey. I'm going to give you the first one. Is it ability? Okay, so it's improved performance during the supervision process in order for it to be considered. It starts with an E. Effective. <laughs> Effective, very good. <laughs> All right. Is meeting with supervisees and having discussions sufficient? What do you guys think? Is that a good way to provide supervision? Just meeting? No. No. What should they do, Yanni? Yeah, all I remember for real is the no. 100% <laughs> like no, because I remember thinking, okay. oh my God. Right. But sure. you need to... What do you guys think? What should they do instead? They need they to could... do one-on-one -on -one observations and feedback sections. We studied this before. Observe and meet, yeah. Observation, demonstrate the skill, maybe. Yeah. So it's not just talk, 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 talk. You need exactly. to actually show, model, everything that we study in the past, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, exactly. So you also need to, besides um, having discussions, um, you also need to manage their time. So they were talking here about uh, timelines, giving them a timeline, giving them a due date, and then also uh, shaping their supervisee's behavior in order for it not to become aversive. Yeah, because they're like our clients, basically. We need to exactly. Less than, I don't like to think about them like staff. I like to think about them like our client, like literally our client. We need to do reinforcement and we need to do a whole. So would you stop them like in the, if you was observing them and you saw them doing, you know, had doing a, a direct, something wrong with the client would you stop them then and correct them like if well, they were I, guess it depends. I guess it depends on what they're doing okay so if it's something that's very unethical then i would stop them right away but if it's something that could wait a little bit then i'll wait until they're done and then tell them right yeah. away tell them immediately after that's okay because I, I, again, these mock questions. I had one like that, and they said, because I said stop, stop the man, but they was like, wait until the end to provide feedback. But I remember my, my supervisor telling me that, you know, he you should stop, stop them. I don't know. What I read, and I think it might have been the same mock, it was like, you, I got it wrong as well, because I said the same thing that you did, but the explanation was that, um, you give the feedback as soon as you can, mm -hmm. like um, before they, they, they implement the plan again. Basically, okay. before, don't give them the chance to make the same error, I guess. And I guess like Dana said, away this is unethical. The client. Hmm? Right. Away exactly. from the client, but it still needs to be during this, like the, you can't wait until the next day. Like it has to be as immediate as possible. Like, don't write it down in the report and give it to them tomorrow. Like, no. it has to be in that observation period. I think, period, yes. Right. But not necessarily, like, right then and there. Okay. Right. Exactly. All right. The next question is, what is the number of supervisees a supervisor can be responsible for? So this is about oh, thought. number. Not like a number is like how many you can do effectively. In other words. There is not a set number, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Pazavik says uh, 10. <laughs> okay. That's what this, Pazavik says. <laughs> this was a trick question. Why, where does it say that on Pazavik? Um, it says that there is no set number. It is individual up to what the supervisor is capable of managing. You could supervise only one supervisee or 10 or more supervisees. Oh, wow. So, but, it says, but it says no precise at the beginning of the sentence that you just mm -hmm. read. Yeah. Very awkward. Because it says no precise number and then it says 10. Hmm. What page is that on Pass the Big? Mm, 292. Okay. All right, so the, the answer was, and that's on Bailey. Uh, it says no precise number. Um, and it was just a trick, you guys. But um, it says, Yeah, it says it is difficult to specify a precise number of supervisees that one supervisor might be responsible for. Right, exactly. So on there, it also says every supervisor is different with some having administrative duties and being responsible of managing their own cases. So it really depends on each um, individual supervisor and their situation. The biggest thing here is like we were talking about, it's quality over quantity. So if, if you're a BCBA and you, you feel like you could only do two, then do two. If you can do 10, great, but you have to figure out what's most effective. Um, what are some other ways to provide supervision? Indirect. Mm -hmm. So we talked, we talked here about shaping, shape their supervisees' behavior, manage their time. Now you're saying indirect. I think indirect yeah. is somewhere. Mm -hmm. Can you give yeah, me some indirect via phone, okay, Skype, so Zoom. Remote? Mm -hmm. Remote, yeah. Okay, so to, okay, so I put remote meetings, assessments, which is indirect, interviews, which is indirect, analyzing data, reviewing videotapes. Um, so like if you're doing, um, you know, any type of recording um, of behaviors, you can rewind it and relook at those behaviors and then explain why the client did that and um, how we can, you know, uh, provide better a better intervention or we can try something new or you know just re going over everything with the supervisee um and training role play anything in that nature you guys want to add anything else because there's tons of different things ways are we good that's good i think you pretty much cover most of them you know okay all right, 5.03 is supervisory delegation. That's uh, page 146 on Bailey. Okay, the first question is, a BCBA can delegate to their supervisee only if they are able to perform blank. Competently, ethically, and safely. Perfect. All right, what can be done if they cannot perform those skills? So if that, if they- Provide training. Perfect. The, it's a B, the BCBA can provide conditions for the acquisition of those skills. So specifically training, but it's for acquisition of whatever skill they're lacking. They're lacking. Right. Yes. Yeah. So you may, you're basically giving them acquisition goals for your supervisee. All right, next question is, what should be done if a supervisee cannot independently perform a program? And whose responsibility is it? So this is a two-part question. Well, it's responsibility of is the, the assigning BCBA. I think that's responsibility, but uh, cannot, they should provide additional training. Perfect. So it's the supervisor, which is the BCBA, and then provide necessary training. Mm -hmm. So there was a section on there that said, never assume. So even though you think like maybe you do an interview in the beginning and you, and it's like the, um, the RBT or the, the BCABA or a newly certified BCBA knows what they're doing. 
gonna assume they know. Like you, you can't just throw them on a case and think, oh, they know exactly what they're doing. They answered all my questions perfectly fine. They know it, you know, by the book, you know, no, that's not the way it is. Um, I actually had a situation that was, um, that came, you know, I thought about when I was reading that because um, I don't want to give a lot of details, but I had a, an RBT that just had got their bachelor's from a very highly, highly, <laughs> um, a prestigious university. So the BCBA thought that because it was a prestigious university that, you know, they were going to know everything the way we thought that she would know. And, and the, the RBT actually answered all the questions. Like, like if it was a, like if she was reading from a book. So we were like, wow, you know, this person knows. And the, the client that we had wasn't even that severe. Like it wasn't SIB or any of that. It was just like task refusal, some physical aggression, but it wasn't even that bad. But you know, we would tell uh, that um, it was a super supervisee at the moment, you know, just redirect, ignore the behavior. And you can see it in the, the person's face that they were very, um, a little bit intimidated. Um, afterwards, when we spoke to that person, they said that all they learned in school was to collect data. So I was like, Oh, okay. You know, it was very shocking. But, but, you know, just because that the person goes to a school that you think that they maybe provide more experience or they get them out in the field, you know, you can never assume. So that was an experience I went through that I was like, wow. <laughs> so It's different reading from the book and passing the test than to actually sitting with a child, living, breathing in front of you, having a mask on. It, it is. It definitely is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was very eye-opening for me as a RBT starting to get my master's in, in as a supervisee in BCBA, as, you know, to get my BCBA. It was in the very beginning. And me seeing that, because I was the RBT on the case, and this was a supervisee that was going to become the BCBA, like taking over the case. So they were going to supervise me. So I was like, oh, wow. You know, it was very eye-opening for me. All right, so 5.04, designing effective supervision and training. Um, I only have three minutes, so I think I'm gonna log out and log back in before I continue. And you're running out of battery. Okay, I'll do that too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. 